everyone. What should we do when life gives us lemons? Well, of course we know we make lemonade. That's what we're going to talk about today. He picked up the lemons that fate had sent him and started a lemonade stand. That was a quote from Marshall Pickney Wilder, who was an actor, and it was his obituary in 1915. So that's what we're going to talk about is the idea of life and lemonades. And we're going to be using the book, The Lemonade Life, How to Fuel Success, Create Happiness, and Conquer Anything by Zach Friedman. Boy, that lemonade story, when you look it up, is kind of interesting. Someone named Julius Rosenwald took that quote and changed it a little bit, saying, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. And then Dale Carnegie popularized it. I like the one from Wanda Sykes. When life gives you lemon, make pink lemonade. Be unique. But we are going to talk about how to have the lemonade life. I think that a lot of people think that they have the worst woe, that they have troubles that other people don't have. And the truth of it is we're all just given a mixed bag. He starts off talking about Warren Buffett and why Warren Buffett's life is so successful. And of course, it has to do, he says, with him being a positive person. He was open to new experiences. He knew how to calculate risks. And he was able to use these principles to make his life better. Warren Buffett did not start out rich. And he lives in the same house in Omaha that he has always lived in, which he bought for $31,000. I was in Omaha, and we drove by his house. Obviously, he expanded just a little bit. But the idea is, is in this book, what lessons can we take from Warren Buffett's life and other people's life of how we can have greatness without, he says, taking shortcuts. There are no shortcuts to it, but we can make strategic decisions about our lives that will actually help us produce a very good life. And he said the lemon life, that's our past life, our current life, and then it eventually becomes our future life. But he says there's a better way to go about it, and that is the lemonade life, where we're taking all the opportunities that are given to us and using them to benefit us and get our goals so that we can change that network where our lives are just lemons and instead we're going and becoming the lemonade life. He thinks, and I thought this was interesting, that really the lemon life is the passive life. I'm a leaf on the wind. Well, the wind just throws me whichever way life goes, but we direct it. And he says that if you feel like you don't have money, that you don't have time, that you're busy uh, on other types of schedules, you're going to keep saying, I'm going to do it later. I'll do it when this happens. I'll do it when that happens. And then that time will never come. So his first step he has is what he calls PRISM. And PRISM stands for perspective, risk, independence, self-awareness, and motion. And he says that when you put these together, this will give you the opportunity for your life. He says that when you change your perspective. You start looking for opportunities and you start looking at things as opportunities, as maybe laments or, oh, this bad thing happened to me. Sometimes you see them as a good thing. Maybe you didn't get a promotion at work, which you wanted. Now you start thinking, well, you know what? This is an opportunity. Now I see what my company thinks of me, or I know ways to fix myself. If we change our perspective, we'll start seeing opportunities, then start changing our view of risk. And instead, we're going to make better decisions so that we can actually take moderated risks, actual risks that will produce good results. When we are independent, we'll think of ourselves as having the freedom to make these changes. When we have self-awareness, which is the S, we'll understand who we are, what we're good at, what our circumstances are, and we'll be able to overcome them. And when we have motion, that means we're going to start doing things. Instead of, again, being the leaf on the wind, we're going to start acting and doing it. He comes in with a couple of ideas that there are a couple of different problem personalities, I guess you would say, that keep us behind. The external excuser. Well, I would have gotten the promotion, but this guy doesn't like me or this thing happened. And you're just making excuses for your life. The steady settler. Now, I think the steady settler was who I was when I was a kid, where you're just trying to keep the status quo. You know, this is good enough. I don't want to change something and potentially make things worse. Right now, okay, I can deal with this. I don't know if I make things worse, would I be able to deal with it? So the steady settler, I understand that. 
the daring disruptor. And that's the person who's always like, I'm going to change things up. I'm going to shake things out. And it's this constant change so that it never gets good. It never gets to be settled and start to grow. Like if you think you plant a seed and every day you move the seed to another part of your backyard, the seed is never going to grow because it needs a little bit of stability to put in roots to start growing the tree. And then the change chaser. And the change chaser is that person who is always trying to kick things up, move things around, not disrupt things like the previous person, but, you know, I'm going to try to constantly change. And he gives kind of pros and cons to each of these, but how do we fight these off? You fight off the external excuser by getting accountability, by having someone who can give you the truth, honest part of it. Did I lose this promotion because someone is out to get me or because the winds blew the wrong day? Maybe that person would be able to help you. Or that the steady settler is just not open to anything new. They're really just trying to chop their life off at a growable, sustainable place. And then they wonder why nothing ever gets better, nothing ever changes. They stopped growing, he says, before they've reached the best parts of their lives, that they, they their true potentials. The disruptors just want to bust up, break up, change everything, whether it's working or not. There's something better. There's always something better. And it kind of goes into the change chasers who want, he says, individuality, crave something better for the lives. They're great at starting new things, and then they're never great at finishing them. I think I said, when I was younger, I was the steady person. Right now, even, become sort of the change chaser. What I've been working on in the past probably decade is not being the change chaser, but actually following through and making actual change happen. He puts it all on a grid between conventional and unconventional, and then the top would be reactive and proactive. And so the steady settler is conventional and proactive. The daring disruptor is proactive and unconventional, while the external excuser is reactive, meaning they only act when they're told they have to act, and conventional, while the change chaser is unconventional, but also reactive. So they come up with great ideas, but they only do so when they have to. All four of them can be problematic when it comes to coming up with your best goals and dreams and getting your life together. And he says a lot of people just sort of look at it that, You work, you make money, you get happy. But instead, you get happy first. And then once you get that happiness, you can move towards freedom. So people kind of have it wrong about happiness in life. Well, I won't be happy until I make this amount of money. I saw a poll survey about the different generations and what they think being successful with money has. And the boomers thought it was 99,000. And I think Gen X thought it was somewhere around 150. And now Gen Z thinks it's 397,000. And if you're going to wait to be happy before you get X amount of money, you're, you're going to have problems. So he talks about, first of all, you want to get your wolf pack together. Those are going to be your best team. You notice the theme of all these books that I review. Getting your team together is such an important step all along. Or finding your team. If you don't have a team, can you find those people who are really going to help you? Not You're not trying to be friends with them so that they help you get your thing, your goals in life, or finding your wolf pack. You don't want to use people. You're not making friends so that they can get you over the finish line on things. But together, as friends, you get each other over the finish line. And that's what's going to be helpful to you is when you have people on your side. And then that will help us get over what he calls the chasm, the chasm of can'ts, meaning there's a big gap. And we're just so afraid of failing that we just don't even do it. He says that the lemonade life is about winning and always having winning is the best option. Obviously, we all want to win, but is there a way that we can win in the end? We may fail in the short term, but we will win in the long run, even if along the way there are some minor failures or minor places where we're not winning. But if we don't keep aspiring, if we keep growing, we're just going to fall into that chasm. He says, too, we have to embrace the rewards of risk. And a lot of things in life take risk. There are some that you've seen with like famous people where they took their last dime and started building computers, buying materials for it, and they went into debt or they 
sold their last car and, and did something drastic like that, but they understood the risk and reward ratio, they have to be able to look at what the downside is. What What is the worst thing that could happen? But taking these educated risks will help us in understanding the reward of risk a little bit better. And so he gives a chart, and I've done this probably my whole life. This was probably the first I don't know, tip I've always done, where I have a spreadsheet and you sort of tally things up. Like I was deciding between my old job and this new job that I eventually took. And I put all the different pros and cons in there. The pro is I already know what my company now thinks of me and they think highly of me. The new company, there's a risk there. This new company had better benefits, but the first company had better pay. And so I went through and I rank ordered or gave number values to each item and then add them up. And you know what? In the end, my old job had 154 points while the new job had 454 points. And so this close decision that I was thinking in my head became very evident about what I needed to do. It says that we should also look at failure as our friend. And we've talked about this in past podcasts, that when we fail, we fine tune our processes. We get better ideas. We come out with ways of understanding what failed, and how we can avoid it. And so our whole ideas become better when we fail than when we succeed. I think about people who start businesses and they never had a failure, maybe because they had, well, let's say a parent who supported their entrepreneurial idea and they never failed at that because they had someone backing them all the way. And then when they brought their thing to market or started to go out on their own, Suddenly it's now hitting the test of time and they can't make it work because they never got challenged along the way. He says that failure will provide clarity. It will help us take new risks because once we've learned how we failed, we'll be able to go out on a limb even farther. And in the end, failure will humble you. Pride is one of the, they say pride cometh before the fall. It is a downfall for you. You've seen people who don't understand, again, through this lens of failure, where they should be more humble. I, I always think about that American Idol tryouts. They always have someone who their whole lives, their family, their friends say, oh, you're a really good singer, never had the strength to tell them the truth. And now they're going on this national show and they look terrible. And so then when they get on the big stage and they're in front of all of television and they falter, suddenly they realize, oh, people have been lying to me my whole life. And the more you fail, the better you're good at it, that you, how you recoup from it, it gets less scary and it gets less detrimental. I noticed the thing about myself, and this is kind of funny, is that because I grew up in such a terrible situation and because I failed a lot, I didn't have resources, I didn't have a lot of help other people had, I failed a lot. I've messed up a lot and I've seen what happens too when my family would have a major setback or failure. So now when I get that happening in my life, I am not that freaked out. But I have had friends all along the way who had really good lives. And the, the moment the smallest thing went done, it was catastrophic to them. So in some ways, I think my bad life inoculated me from future potential downfalls. And what we have to do is we have to have loyalty in us, work ethic. We have to drive hard. You see a lot of people who have big dreams and their work ethic is not there. They say, well, this job I have now is below me. This project I'm working on, this company I'm working for, they're below me. I will go get a better job someday, then I'll work hard. The truth of the matter is, is if you don't work hard for the lousy jobs or the jobs that you think are below you, which you shouldn't think jobs are below you, everyone does something just to get by for a while. The question is, is do you rise above that? If you aren't working hard in the small things, you're not going to work hard in the big things. No one will give you a chance then to do the big things because you didn't do the small things. We also should have respect for other people and treat people fairly. And I think with regards to kindness and forgiveness and mercy and all those things, we should have integrity 
and emotional intelligence. I have seen some very talented people in my life and particularly in my last company who were really talented people. They had no emotional intelligence. They'd fly off the handle. They'd be too bold when they shouldn't be too bold or they would say things they shouldn't say and that one thing just kept them down. And so he says that when we do work with other people and we are trying to get our goals, he says that it's important that we have facts, that we're able to prove our points to other people, that we're able to show evidence of our points, we'll be able to speak objectively and fairly. Even when I'm at work and I have just thought of this great idea, I'm that person who will go to the boss and say, I just thought of this great idea. I think we can rearrange how product support goes. The pros of it is that it'll make us more efficient. The cons of it is that it'll be a little bit more complicated to figure out who is supporting what thing on that day. I'm just making something up, but I was always that person who was very good at giving the pros and cons of my own ideas. And avoiding hyperbole, that's the big thing. You talk to people and they say, I am literally dying here. No, you're not dying. Because people really will start to lose faith in you if you speak in hyperbole. They just won't trust anything that you have to say. So we're going to wrap it up there. We're going to talk next week about what we can do now that we want to gain that sort of life we want to have. And my challenge to you is think of a couple of areas where my challenge to you is think about which of those four categories of people are you most like? Are you someone who's just trying to keep the steady pace? Are you someone who has excuses for everything and usually they're external excuses? Are you disruptors who just have to risk everything and break everything all the time and never really get any headway? Or are you someone who is constantly feeling like you're being put to change all the time without letting that change take root, without ever following through? Start thinking a little bit about what happens to you and which of these four categories is holding your life back more. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening and watching this podcast. Please remember that you can always email me at jill at startwithsmallsteps.com. I'd love to hear from you. And if we're on a video service, you're also welcome to message right here. Please remember, whatever you're doing with this podcast, video, subscribe, tell a friend. And remember that our walk towards having that life we want might mean taking a few lemons and turning them into lemonade or a lemonade stand.